right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about why dual five gigs, oh crap, sorry, that's the wrong prezo. We're actually gonna talk about <laughs> polarizing figures in wireless. Um, so just a little bit about me real quick. Uh, CWNE253 was sitting in this room last year um, without having completed any of the certification exams whatsoever. Sped through the four exams and got my application in to get my numbers in October of last year. So for those of you out there that may be sitting in this room with that same thought today about, can I really do this? Where do I wanna go? It can be done. Just take time, diligence, work through it. It's a great program, you'll learn a lot, even if you're like me and you've been doing this for a while. So, <clears throat> excuse me. All right. Uh, if you wanna get in touch with me, social media, um, blog posts, blog.theitrebel.com. Um, again, that's theitrebel.com. For those of you that don't know, I'm from Mississippi. My college mascot was the Ole Miss Rebels. Um, so therefore, IT Rebel, put two and two together, you'll figure it all out. Um, pretty active on everything, respond as quick as I can. And unlike Matthew, um, you can tell the true salespeople in the room, you know, they've got fancy little clickers and all. I don't, I like to walk around, so you'll see me jump back and forth and tap a slide here or there. But anyway, so what I wanna talk about today is polarizing figures in wireless. No, we're not talking about Devin, we're not talking about Ben, we're talking about antennas. The things that surprisingly seem to be pushed a lot in the industry. I know we've heard from Excel Techs, we've got people here from Ventive. They're great products. But how many of you can count how many times you've seen external antennas used in your organization? How many of you use external antennas in your organization? Okay, thank you. We have the right crowd here today, so I don't feel totally off. I face this battle a lot with customers. You go to a customer, you have a meeting, you try to set out what the expectations are, what they're wanting to do, where they want coverage, where they don't, and it never fails that we always come back to the solution of, well, I want that nice, shiny indoor access point, right, with the integrated antennas, something that I can literally, as Ronco used to say when he made the old timer rotisseries, I'm gonna set it and forget it. I wanna put it up there, I don't wanna touch it, I don't wanna move it, it's just gonna stay there forever. So we talk about antennas, I've got some numbers here. These are vendor agnostic. I've talked to a few, kind of pulled a few vendors to see kind of what sales figures were like at all in the access point lines that they have. So we see vendor one, two, and three, 90%, 94, and 98. Anybody have any clue what these numbers represent? Correct. It's the number, the percentage of AP sold with internal or integrated antennas in your product line, 98%. So out of all the, the hundreds of thousands slash millions of units sold from that particular vendor, only 2% of those units are actually the external antenna variety. So why no external AP love? Okay, I'm a big proponent of external antennas. I do a lot in LPV just like Chris did as we heard earlier this morning with his deployment um, recommendations and all kind of how to streamline that process. In LPV, you can do internal antennas, but a lot of times what we find in LPV is you, we wanna keep the signal away from certain areas and we wanna guide it to where we want it. So reasons to use external antennas. Number one, aesthetics. Okay, this is the predominant factor that I see today in customer bases of why they wanna to go to an external antenna. I've done a lot of work over the years. I used to work for Maru Networks, now Fort Aru for Mitch over there. Um, been in cruise ships, been in college and universities across the world where they have aesthetic concerns because they're historical buildings, right? So one thing that you can't always do is you can't go into a historical building that's on the register and just put an access point up like you would want to. You have to be cognizant of how the aesthetics play into that building and what the guidelines and recommendations are for those aesthetic communities that we have to deal with and those committee members, right? Number two, construction and materials. We heard Blake talk about doing Wi-Fi on cruise ships. Blake and I have actually worked on a couple of the same cruise ships in the last few years. And the one thing that he mentioned was cruise ships are literally nothing but big metal cages with smaller metal cages inside of them. So what do you find 
happens in those places. We don't just run an ethernet cable and slab up an AP in the room. But what we typically do is we use external antennas in those smaller boxes, in those cabin areas and all that you rent out for two, $300 a night or whatever that cruise ship may be worth. We do that so that engineers on board working on the ship can have access to the hardware and make changes and repair things without having to disturb the passengers on the ship, right? It also makes it a lot easier because if we snag a cable while the ship shifts or something like that, then we're just simply replacing a coax cable and not having to replace or pull a new wire or something like that in the ship. So it's very important when you're looking at your design to make sure that we guide that signal to where we want it to. We control the energy output by that AP. You know, I have a, a interesting case at my house. I live on the Gulf Coast in Mississippi, uh, very much a hurricane zone for those of you that uh, you know are aware of a little storm called Katrina. Yep, that was where I'm at. Um, what I found is that with different construction types and all like that, you have different densities of materials, as we all are aware. So I have two access points on a two-story home, one on opposite ends of the house. And what I found was that my wife always complains about wireless working in one particular area of our second floor. So what did I do? Rather than shift the AP around, we did a little testing. I put a wall plate AP in. And that wall plate AP is probably only about 15 feet away from where the actual omnidirectional AP is mounted in the ceiling. But what I was able to do with that, that wall plate AP is utilize the radiation pattern of that antenna to put it exactly where I want it to and not spew it behind me to cause interference with the other access points in the environment. Environmental factors. We typically find a lot of environmental factors such as temperature and moisture um, lend themselves to using external antennas better than an integrated antenna AP. Um, these I predominantly use in cases where I need to put an access point outdoors, but the customer doesn't want to necessarily have this strange looking figure hanging off of the building. So what we can do is we can drill a couple holes, put an external antenna up, silicone it right, then we're protecting the integrated, or excuse me, we're protecting the AP indoors and still getting the signal where we need it outdoors and not having to fight through glass and construction materials and all that we would normally have to deal with. So designing, uh, like I said, do a lot in LPV. So what do we do in LPV? The biggest thing that we do in LPV is we try to keep the cell sizes extremely small. Um, on the screen, you'll see a representative map of an arena that I was working on previously. Um, AP mounting is somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 70 feet um, from where the users are gonna be in the seats. Um, we wanna keep that small, that cover cell small, so how do we do it? We can't go in and throw an omnidirectional antenna in, right? We would have basically one big coverage area for every single access point in there. It produces really poor results. I've seen it, I've been in afterwards, and it doesn't work. So we try to keep cell sizes small by using a 30 degree antenna, 60 degree antenna, some antenna pattern, right, that we can focus that energy on a session, on a section, excuse me, and keep the user experience in individual sections high while not having to have users with a lot of latitude in which cell they're gonna to connect to. Because in LPV, we design for such large numbers, we have to keep those cells small and not provide a lot of overlap. We're not talking about doing voice roaming here, we're simply talking about providing that one to two megabits per second for users to upload their YouTube, their FaceTime, uh, playing on Slack like some in the front row might be doing right now, Rob. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we're, we're, we're giving them low, low amounts of data, but yet we have to keep that cell size small because we may have 75 to 100 users in that environment. And as we've seen from some testing that Daryl showed us last year, some stuff that Devin's posted up, a single stream device, you're probably only gonna get between 15 and 25 maybe per cell and not maximize the airtime that you have available on that channel. So design techniques. Drew, I gotta have some fun with you on this one. I know it was all in jest. This is not the design technique. The cups are great, but you can't design like that. <laughs> so how do I design for using external antennas? Trigonometry, anybody have bad feelings of that word from high school when they had to learn it? Yeah, I know I did, um, never enjoyed it. But trigonometry actually helps a lot 
Um, I use this little, a website called Triangle Calculator. It works great for helping me determine what the rough cell size for the antenna pattern that I'm gonna be using in the environment is gonna be. So as we see here, I'll put up a couple of examples. Um, this is actually off of my uh, CWNE application, one of my essays. Um, so in the picture on the left, you'll see the triangle calculator. This is just a snippet of the website. On the right is gonna be our kind of real world deployment scenario. So we're using a 30 degree antenna. Um, we get the height by simply taking a laser range finder, going in, we're gonna shoot to where our antenna is gonna be at. We're gonna get that height. We're gonna plug that into our calculator. Um, you'll see in this case, our height was 50 feet. Um, so we'll use that in the um, long side on the right side of our triangle in the image on the left. Plug in our math for a 30 degree beam width and it's gonna tell us our roughly anticipated cell size is gonna be about 29 feet. Obviously, I know this is not, you know, we're not talking about cells that are perfect circles. Obviously, you know, we've all seen the antenna radiation patterns, right? But this helps you get some idea of how large that cell size is gonna be so you can plan according to your environment. And then lastly on aiming, the one thing that I found works best is to build a rig. We simply, I took a couple of pieces of plywood, cut them to the antenna size that was needed, drilled a hole for a laser sight to be put in the middle, and then strap it to the AP as you can see on the image on the right. And that makes aiming these things um, so much easier and keeps you from having to go back and forth up and down stairs as well as you know man lifts or whatever you might be using. Um, so that's it. Um, if you want, if you have any questions, hit me up on social media. Let me know. Be glad to answer them and check out my blog. Thanks.